Good afternoon. Welcome to McGuire Woods webinar on Alston and name, image, and likeness. I'm Janet Payton. I'm a partner in the firm's intellectual property and data privacy practice and a member of our education team. And I'm joined today by two of my colleagues in our Washington, D.C. office, Reed Smith and Farnas Thompson. Reed is an antitrust lawyer with deep experience in the kinds of matters that the Alston case actually considered. And Farnas joined us recently from the Department of Education, where she worked as the Deputy General Counsel for Post-Secondary Education and worked daily with Title IX. So she has deep experience with that from both the DOE perspective and from the perspective of in-house university counsel. Um, so Farnaz and Reed will help me talk through name, image, and likeness issues for the first half of this program. And then in the second half, we're delighted to welcome William Throw, the general counsel of the University of Kentucky and a member of the NCAA General Counsel Advisory Board, who will speak with us about his perspective on name, image, and likeness issues and on Alston, and then we'll be very happy to take questions. So thank you for being with us today. So this is sort of an overview of what we're going to talk about. I am first going to give you just some background on name, image, and likeness rights generally, because name, image, and likeness are IP rights. So this is why you have an intellectual property lawyer on this panel speaking with you today. Then Reed will go through antitrust issues, and Farnas will talk about the educational benefits, issues that are raised, and implications for Title IX um, that have come up in the wake of Alston. And as I said at the end, we'll have a real treat with a conversation with William Throw. So first, name, image, and likeness as an IP right. Um, the right of publicity is an IP right that arises under state law. And it's actually fairly new. Unlike IP rights like copyright that are in the Constitution, for example, um, it's really only been since 1953 that we've had a fairly widely accepted concept of a right of publicity arising under state law. Um, but many of you have interacted with it, even if you didn't realize that it was really a right of publicity that you were dealing with, just in the context of every school has issues related to photo releases, right? Um, everyone who has ever represented even an elementary school knows or has a child that went to one, <laughs> that you have to sign a permission for your child's photo to be used for various you know, purposes of advertising or publicity. So that concept, the concept that individuals have the right to control their image, um, really came to be in a decision in 1953, uh, the Halen v. Topps decision, which identified two aspects of this right. And it really is a double-sided coin. Privacy and publicity are two sides of the same thing. And what that decision said was that individuals have the right to control their name, image, and likeness, both in the context of stopping use of it, in other words, the right to say, you may not use my name, my image, my likeness, and the right to grant exclusivity with respect to that use. The Topps case, uh, the Halen case, was actually a case about baseball players and their images being used on chewing gum cards. So classic 1950s uh, type of case, but that is where we get this right. <clears throat> and it is now enshrined in actual statute in almost half the states, but Many, many states at least have this concept in their case law if they don't actually have a right of publicity statute on their books. Um, so states have codified this concept that written permission of the individual is required before their name or likeness or in some states their photograph or their voice can be used for a commercial purpose. And I'll just throw in a note here about those photo releases because 
these state laws do have differences. And it's important to know what your individual state law says about right of publicity. Um, you know, for example, Georgia is one that we always try to make sure we don't run afoul of if we're doing a photo release that can be used throughout the country, because Georgia's statute has some very specific language about the right to use it for financial gain. Um, so just know that this is one of those funny little issues where we've never had federal legislation. Uh, we don't have much promise of federal legislation now, um, even though in the wake of Austin, there's been a lot of discussion about it. But I'm not sure how realistic it is. Um, just like privacy rights, where we have states every day passing privacy bills, like California's privacy bill and Virginia's privacy bill and now Colorado, um, it's a patchwork. And while it would be great to have federal legislation to make it easier to understand how to comply, it doesn't look super likely that that's going to happen in the immediate future. <clears throat> now, though, in the wake of the Alston decision, and maybe... It, frankly, there's a relationship in the other direction, too, with respect to the NCAA seeing states passing laws. Um, states have moved into the concept specifically of athletes' rights of publicity, because up to this point, athletes' rights to control their image were curtailed by the NCAA rules. So even though athletes had these rights under state law, the NCAA rules did not allow them to benefit from the use of their name and likeness for monetary compensation, as we all know. So the, the laws that we have today, and there are quite a few that have passed in the last six months, a huge number literally went into effect on July 1st. Um, they have a lot of similarities, even though just like those photo release type publicity laws, they are not at all identical. So I've just called out some common provisions that show up again and again in the statutes that have already been passed and to some extent um, in the executive orders, because there are a number of states where, although the legislature hasn't acted yet, the governor has issued an executive order. Um, so. These themes that we keep seeing in the statutes and in the executive orders are primarily an express right for college athletes to earn compensation for the use of their name, image, and likeness. Um, and then the statutes start to vary, but many of them, if not all of them, have some sort of limitation on the rules, you know, the sort of the converse express limitation on what conferences or universities uh, could do to tamper with those rights or dampen those rights. Some have express um, NCAA language in them that says the NCAA cannot restrict in this way. Um, and others are more vague. But they all tend to say, essentially, we intend to protect college athletes from schools and conferences treading too much on their right to publicity. They all bring in the concept of agents. And obviously, this is blowing up in the news. And I'm sure you've all read lots about the right to engage third party agents for purposes of negotiating contracts that would allow athletes to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. One theme that is fairly consistent with respect to those provisions is that the schools cannot serve in that role, that the schools themselves cannot be the agents. Um, the schools have to step back and allow those relationships to happen between athletes and independent third party agents. Um, <clears throat> although the statutes do exclude some industries. So the, the one thing that we have seen in a number of them that appears to say, well, we're going to give them all these rights and we're going to let them make money using their name, image, and likeness, but we're going to be okay with a little morality um, restriction. So a number of these statutes have express provisions not allowing the types of endorsements that, uh, that they might find unattractive for athletes or particularly um, athletes under 21 years old, like 
alcohol type endorsements or adult entertainment, gambling, those kinds of things. Um, there is still a little bit of a morality twist in a number of these statutes. Um, they also tend to agree on the concept, although not always in the details, that name, image, and likeness compensation should not impact eligibility for scholarships. It should not impact the um, evaluation of a, of a student's financial need uh, with respect to grant made or stipend eligibility. Um, so it's, it's interesting to, it will be interesting to see how that plays out um, because it, it certainly seems like in the classic analysis of financial ability, um, that revenue stream would be considered. <clears throat> um, many of the states have some kind of a disclosure requirement that the athlete must share, disclose their contract with their school. And similarly, many have provisions that say the athlete can't enter into a contract if the contract itself would conflict with an obligation that the school or the team already has in a contract. So we can assume that the reason these disclosure requirements are there are mainly to allow schools the opportunity to review them and say, this isn't going to work because it has a provision that will conflict with one of our existing contracts. Um, we are interested to see how those contracts start coming in and if our education clients are looking for a review uh, because some of these have very, very quick turnaround obligations like Pennsylvania, I believe, has a seven-day turnaround. Um, so in-house legal departments at universities could find themselves inundated with uh, contracts that need to be reviewed very quickly and compared to existing licensing contracts that the school or the team already has in place. And then we get to remedies. And remedies is certainly a place where there is a lot more variation among the state laws. Some of them do have a private right of action. And of course, we are bracing ourselves to see what happens with those rights. Some um, even have injunctive relief. And then others are vague or don't say at all um, exactly what kind of a remedy an athlete might have. So obviously, this is an area that is going to um, develop, and we anticipate it's going to develop very quickly. So this is a list of the states that have name, image, and likeness laws in effect, or in several cases, executive orders in effect, as of July 1st. Um, and this list just grew exponentially. And we've even seen some states that had passed bills, but with an effective date later than July 1st, turn and amend those existing statutes to say, actually, we're going to speed this up. We're going to put it in place July 1st. So <clears throat> this is the list. And the slides, if you are able to download the slides, the slides that our team will provide to you will have live links here. So all of these should actually lead you to the individual statutes as a resource. And then I haven't listed every statute that goes into effect beyond 12 months out, because we fully anticipate those are going to be further amended. Um, but just to give you a sense of what's coming soon, for example, Arizona will go into effect next week. Um, and then Arkansas, Tennessee, and Nevada all um, first of the year <clears throat> so halfway through this coming school year, which is not particularly helpful um, from the academic calendar standpoint, and South Carolina next July 1st. Um, so that is a very quick overview of the intellectual property rights that come into play with name, image, and likeness. And now, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to turn things to my colleague, Reed Smith, because as we said, Alston really was an antitrust case. Alston was about antitrust, uh, you know, potential violations of the Sherman Act um, and was brought by current and former student athletes under that theory. 
But we are seeing that the convergence of the Austin decision with these name, image, and likeness state statutes pushed the NCAA to effectively seed the whole landscape um, with respect to name, image, and likeness um, compensation. They've ceded it to states, and where there is no state law, it's basically ceded to conferences and to schools. So <clears throat> turning it over to antitrust and to my colleague Reed to actually talk about Austin and what that means from an antitrust perspective. Thanks, Janet. And uh, as Janet mentioned, Alston at its core is an antitrust case, and it's important to understand a little bit about the, the antitrust principles in the case um, in order to uh, have a sense of where things may be going in terms of educational benefits, name, image, likeness, and other compensation for, for student athletes. <clears throat> so a bit about the procedural history of NCAA v. Alston. As, as Janet mentioned, it's a case that was brought by student athletes and specifically by uh, football and men's and women's uh, basketball players against the NCAA and 11 conferences. And the, the legal theory in the case is a violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, uh, which is the antitrust statute that prohibits price fixing and, and other conduct. And while it, it worked its way to the Supreme Court, we actually need to go back to the district court decision to, to understand the full scope of Alston. The district court held and, and the Court of Appeals affirmed, first, that the NCAA's rules that limit athletic scholarships to the cost of attendance are reasonable and allowed. In other words, the NCAA can create a rule that bans unlimited payments uh, to student athletes. Secondly, the district court held that NCAA rules that cap education related benefits are illegal and it enjoined uh, those rules. It did say, the district court, that the NCAA could regulate how, how conferences and schools provide those education-related compensation and benefits. We're going to talk a lot more about that here in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So the student, interestingly, the student athletes didn't appeal the, the holding that, uh, that unlimited payments um, could be regulated by the NCAA. On the flip side, the NCAA appealed the holding that education-related benefits uh, could not be capped. So the sole issue before the Supreme Court was whether the NCAA could cap education-related benefits. So moving on to the Supreme Court decision, the first question that the court looked at is what is the anti-competitive harm that, may res that results from the education-related benefits uh, restrictions that the NCAA has put in place. Well, importantly, the NCAA did not contest uh, some factual issues. It did not contest that its rules fix the maximum compensation that student athletes can receive in return for their labor. So the way that the, the, way that the Supreme Court viewed the relationship here is that student athletes uh, are, in essence, employees who labor in the form of playing uh, intercollegiate athletics. The NCAA is an employer in the sense that it provides compensation to uh, student athletes in the form of scholarships and, and uh, other cost of attendance benefits. And, and it's important to understand that the, the Supreme Court kind of viewed it in this employee-employer context uh, and fit it into the antitrust laws in that way. The second item that the Supreme Court did not contest is that it has what's called monopsony power. Monopsony power is essentially monopoly power, but instead of being a monopoly seller, the NCAA is a monopsony buyer. It is the only buyer out there of student athlete services, uh, at least in, in terms of um, high level college athletes. High level college athletes can't say, you know what, I'm not going to play for an NCAA institution. I'm going to go and find some other like similar institution uh, where I can um, play my games, in essence, uh, exert my labor. 
And in, in the antitrust laws, a monopsonist, by definition, has both the ability and the incentive to suppress wages. So here the Supreme Court said that the NCAA was able, as a monopsonist, to reduce and suppress uh, the compensation that students, student athletes received uh, for, for playing uh, intercollegiate athletics. The second question posed in NCAA v. Alston is whether the NCAA has a sufficient pro-competitive justification for its restraint. And so here the justices uh, used what's a traditional antitrust uh, test, the rule of reason test. The rule of reason test is essentially a balancing test and is heavily fact specific. Uh, and, and judges and, and justices here who look at the rule of reason uh, do a very deep dive into the market that's involved and uh, the, the payments that were being made. The NCAA argued here that its restraint capping education related benefits was necessary to maintain amateurism. And amateurism is important to the NCAA because it makes college sports distinct from professional sports. And interestingly, the NCAA's argument was not that student athletes received a benefit from the restraint on, on educational benefits, but that it was consumers who received that benefit and that their consumers of college athletics fans uh, want a product that is distinct from professional sports. And so if the NCAA were to provide uh, unlimited payments or even payments above a, a certain amount to its student athletes, fans out there would, would uh, no longer see a distinction between college sports and professional sports and, and uh, college sports would lose demand as a result. That was the NCAA's argument. The, the uh, Supreme Court didn't really agree with the NCAA's argument on amateurism, and it said that, uh, the, that really student athletes should have education-related benefits, uh, up, up, and the NCAA should not be able to, to cap those. So question three here, what do the antitrust laws allow and prevent moving forward? Well, there's a little bit of speculation involved in this slide, uh, but it's clear that the Supreme Court prevents the NCAA from making rules restricting educational benefits. That's the holding of NCAA v. Alston. Second, it likely allows schools to make their own rules related to educational benefits. Reason being is under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, you have to have two entities coming to some type of an agreement. If a, a single uh, school out there were to make its own rules, uh, it's not coming to an agreement with any other schools. And so uh, a school could choose to cap its own educational related benefits to student athletes if it, if it desired to do so. Third, the Supreme Court decision likely allows conferences to make their own rules related to ed educational benefits. And this goes for NIL as well. Reason being because conferences on their own likely lack the monopsony by market power that I discussed a couple slides ago. Uh, if a student doesn't like the, the rules that uh, the SEC, for instance, is putting out, a student athlete could choose to go and play in a different conference that may have, have rules that, uh, it, that the student athlete prefers. And then finally, the NCAA v. Alston does not provide guidance on payments beyond educational benefits with an exception. Justice Kavanaugh wrote a concurrence, and he was the only one to sign on to the concurrence, but in the concurrence, he specifically states that the NCAA's remaining compensation rules also raise serious questions under antitrust laws. So there, he's opening the door for future, uh, a future case that may come to the Supreme Court uh, on the NCAA's rules uh, related to, to unlimited compensation. And so we may see future litigation in, in that respect, but that's not covered specifically by NCAA v. Alston. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Farnaz, who's going to speak a little bit more. Thank you, Reed. 
I'm just going to briefly cover educational benefits and the implications for Title IX. If you don't mind passing the. Thank you. So as Reed mentioned, the scope of NCAA versus Alston is fairly narrow because of the class of student athletes that sued and also because of the issues that were presented before the Supreme Court. So really, this injunction that the Supreme Court upheld affects two classes of student athletes, those who are in the NCAA Division I football bowl subdivision, which happens to be all men, as well as the men's and women's NCAA Division I basketball. So all the rules for those two groups of student athletes have changed with respect to education-related benefits, but really the other student athletes and what the NCAA will do for them remains a question mark. And so since we don't know what the NCAA will do, we're just gonna focus on what the NCAA has already done because the NCAA already in August of 2020 changed its bylaws to comply with the injunction. So after NCAA versus Alston, the NCAA can and has continued to limit athletic scholarships to the full cost of attendance. So absent the two exceptions for the football athletes and the student athletes who are in the NCAA Division I basketball, NCAA really has limited athletic scholarships to the cost of attendance. And then NCAA can continue to limit compensation and benefits that are not related to education. And the Supreme Court in dicta stated that the NCAA can have a no Lamborghini rule. So for example, the NCAA can state that schools can't give student athletes Lamborghinis to play at their school. What the NCAA cannot do though, is limit education related compensation or benefits um, that conferences and schools may provide to student athletes. And it's really just, again, with respect to men's division one football, bowl subdivision and men's and women's division one basketball. Now, even with the education related benefits though, the NCAA still has some power, right? Because the NCAA can propose a definition of what constitutes education related benefits. And as we all know as attorneys, the person who has that, or the entity that has the authority to define education-related benefits still wields a lot of power. The NCAA can also regulate how conferences and schools provide those education-related benefits. And finally, something that people gloss over is that the NCAA can actually still limit the cash awards for academic achievement as long as the cap on the awards for academic achievement is the same as the cap on awards for athletic achievement. And that's really currently quite low, it's just $5,980 annually. So with respect to that, not much has actually changed in the NCAA bylaws. So the NCAA bylaws actually don't have to technically change after NCAA versus Alston, but we'll just go over a few of them that did change in August of 2020. So again, you see that the rule is that the scholarships are limited to the cost of attendance, except for a very narrow subclass, right? There's really only two exceptions, and those are for basketball and the football bowl subdivision. And that's with respect to vocational scholarships. So now schools and conferences can provide the student athletes scholarships to attend a vocational school. And then also for those subcategories of student athletes, they can provide post eligibility scholarships for undergraduate or graduate degrees. So that's how the NCAA is defining education related benefits with respect to scholarships. And then with respect to other education related benefits, again, there's a cap for everyone else except for men's football and men's and women's basketball, at least with respect to division one. And so there's no cap currently for those student athletes when it comes to computers, science equipment, musical instruments, tutoring, expenses for studying abroad that aren't covered in the cost of attendance and paid post eligibility internships. And again, the Supreme Court and the NCAA have made clear that with respect to the post eligibility internships, it's the, the schools and the conferences that can provide them. So Nike, for example, couldn't provide a post eligibility internship that essentially paid the student athlete the same amount they'd be paid if they were a professional athlete. And finally, this is the NCAA bylaw that we already discussed with respect to the cap on 
academic awards, and that cap on academic awards remains the same as the cap for athletic awards, which is approximately $6,000. So all of these different rule changes and any rule changes that are forthcoming will always implicate Title IX. And there's really two issues under Title IX. The first is equal opportunity. And the second is really with respect to athletic scholarships. So the rule, the regulation for Title IX is essentially that a recipient has to provide equal athletic opportunity to members of both sexes. And the regulation actually lists 10 different factors as to what it means to provide equal athletic opportunity. And interestingly enough, two of those factors align almost identically with the education-related benefits listed in the NCAA bylaws. So for example, equipment is one of them and tutoring. So to the extent that you can provide unlimited tutoring to your men's football NCAA Division I team, you have to be really careful because there's no equivalent women's football team. So you've got to make sure that you're providing those tutoring benefits to other women's sports, but wait a minute, you can't because the only cap lifted for tutoring is really with respect to women's Division I basketball. So there's a little bit of a dance that you have to do here in making sure that you're providing equal athletic opportunity. And with respect to athletic scholarships, you have to take into account that you're also providing reasonable opportunities for members of the, both of each sex. And reasonable opportunity really comes down to what's called the substantial proportionality test. And that test is that each of the sexes receives proportionately the same amount of scholarships, not necessarily the same amount for each sex. So you don't exactly have to give the same amount for men that you do for women, but substantial proportionality means essentially that if 50% of your student athletes are female, then 50% of the financial assistance or the scholarships should be awarded to female student athletes. And with respect to the substantial proportionality test, there is really a factor that the department considers. The department's Office for Civil Rights does compliance reviews. And if there is a disparity with respect to scholarships, the department will look at whether there is a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for that disparity. So a legitimate reason could be that a lot of the female student athletes are from out of state. And if you have to give an out of state scholarship, that's a lot more money than an in-state scholarship. So for example, the women tend to get more, but there are fewer women, they just happen to get more overall as women because most of them are from out of state, then that could be a legitimate non-discriminatory reason as to why the financial assistance might be disproportionate between the sexes. And finally, I think the concern that no one's voicing yet is that if the schools make less money on the revenue generating sports, it's going to affect the types of sports that schools can offer. So schools are going to be put in a difficult situation of deciding which sports teams to continue and which ones to cut. And when you do that, you're always going to be facing some Title IX challenges. And there's really a three-part test for that. One is the substantial proportionality test, and that looks at your student female population or technically the unrepresented population in sports and whether that unrepresented population is substantially the same with when it comes to your student athletes. So if 60% of your full-time students are female, the expectation is that 60% of your student athletes will be female or will be in some kind of sports program. And we all know that that's a really high burden to meet. So, and that's actually the test that the courts look at. So it's a three-part test, but the courts really just look at that substantial proportionality test. The other two factors that the department will consider, but that won't really mean as much to a court, is whether the school has a history of expanding opportunities for the underrepresented sex. And if the school does have that history, then the department will give it some deference. And finally, the last thing that the department will look at in its three-part test, and that three-part test is in the 1979 policy interpretation, is whether the school has kind of surveyed its student athletes to determine whether the opportunities that are offered actually are consistent with the interests, abilities, and talents of the student population. So if you have 60% of your student population happen to be females, but they're content with the sports offering and then they don't really want 
to be have more sports offerings and it's consistent with that underrepresented sexes, talents, abilities, and interests, then that's something else that the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights will consider. So with respect to considerations for schools, I think that you really should be looking at conference rules and regulations if you represent a school because, again, the conferences can practically adopt the NCAA rules that were in effect before the Austin case, and they could continue that regime. So really, you look at your conference rules, and then you should definitely look at your state's rules regarding name, image, and likeness. And I really didn't talk much about name, and image, and likeness with respect to Title IX, but I think if a school, as Janet mentioned, has the opportunity under state law to review a contract, then that school has to make sure that it's reviewing and processing contracts for female student athletes as quickly as it is for male student athletes, right? We can't have any kind of disparity there because that will affect the equal athletic opportunity regulation. And finally, I think the question is, even if the institution may provide education-related benefits or allow student athletes to profit on their name, image, and likeness, how will those benefits really impact Title IX? And again, that'll really be a fact-specific inquiry. Well, that concludes our presentation, but it is my honor to introduce to you Bill Throw who is the general counsel of the University of Kentucky, and he's had to deal with all of these issues and will shed some light as to how he has done so. Bill Throw is the former Solicitor General of Virginia, and he's a constitutional scholar. Over the course of his career, he has served as a chief legal officer for both a flagship research university, the University of Kentucky, and a public liberal arts college, Christopher Newport University. He's litigated constitutional issues in the Supreme Court of the United States and lower appellate courts, and he's taught courses on the Constitution at both the undergraduate level as well as at law schools. He is the recipient of many awards, including the Stetson University's Kaplan Award for Higher Education, Law, and Policy, and he's a fellow of the National Association of College and University Attorneys. He is also a member of the NCAA General Counsel Advisory Board, and I'll mention that he's an expert in Title IX, and I highly recommend his book, Title IX, The Transformation of Sex Discrimination in Education, and he hasn't paid me to say that. His scholarship is cited in footnotes in the Title IX final rule that the Department of Education published in May of 2020, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Bill. Thank you, <clears throat> and, and it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, at least uh, remotely. Perhaps someday we will be in situation where we can have uh, these sorts of discussions uh, in person. Again, um, I'm happy to join you. Uh, I do say uh, at the outset that I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Nothing that I'm saying necessarily is the views of the University of Kentucky, uh, the NCAA, or uh, the Southeastern Conference, but this is a, a fascinating issue. And uh, I know there are uh, some questions uh, that Fairness has uh, prepared, so go ahead. Well, as a general counsel of an NCAA Division I university, were you expecting the outcome in NCAA versus Alston? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, and, and, and I may be, one, may, may be one of the few people uh, in my position that was actually uh, anticipating uh, this result. Uh, it was clear to me uh, when I read the briefs that uh, I thought the uh, athletes had, had the better argument. Uh, and it was difficult for uh, the NCAA to uh, rely on the amateurism defense, the amateurism deference that they were were um, using from um, a case in, in the early 1980s. Uh, once oral mm -hmm. argument uh, happened, it was clear to me it was going to be nine nothing. Uh, the decision was actually a little broader than what I expected. Normally, uh, a nine nothing decision is sort of a, a middle of the road type uh, thing because people, um, that's the only way to get nine justices. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh's uh, concurring opinion uh, did sort of surprise me in that um, I think it's rare for a Supreme Court uh, justice to actually say, here are the implications of the decision that we just made. And basically, here's a roadmap for how to to, uh, to sue the NCAA, which is kind of how I view um, Justice Kavanaugh's opinion. So 
you th that's interesting. You thought that the holding was broader. I mean, it's still limited to education related benefits for football and basketball. But what implications do you think it has for other NCAA roles? Right. Well, let's, you know, we, the NCAA likes to say that the decision is, is narrower and certainly the, the opinion on its face is narrow. It's, it's limited to the, the sole rules that were at issue before the NCAA. But Marbury versus Madison was limited to the issue of whether or not uh, Mr. Marbury got his commission. And as we all know, it's it's quite broader than that. And Brown versus Board of Education is more than about the the school attendance zones in Topeka, Kansas. So what we have in the case is first and foremost um, a repudiation of the defense that the NCAA had relied upon really for forty years, and that was that uh, amateur athletics and amateurism in college sports was incredibly important and that essentially the courts would always defer to the NCAA if they decided that it was um, necessary to uh, achieve amateurism. I, I think that is realistically gone as a defense. Now, that doesn't mean that the NCAA can't win uh, another antitrust case. Um, I think there, but um, I think every NCAA um, limit on the amount of benefits that athletes can receive is at the moment um, suspect under uh, the reasoning of, of, of Alston. Um, I think the NCAA probably could say that uh, all college athletes have to actually enroll in college, uh, have to actually uh, go to class and, and remain eligible, and that uh, they can be limited to you know four or five years of uh, participation. You know, nobody's going to come in, uh, become a college athlete at 18, and then still be a college athlete uh, when they're 40. So that sort of thing. But the the other um, the limitations that uh, the NCAA has has imposed, uh, I think, are uh, are suspect under uh, under the court's analysis. Now, Congress obviously could could uh, intervene. Um, Supreme Court may decide that they um, want to to change their mind. But given the the breadth of the opinion, given what Justice Kavanaugh said in in his concurrence, given the litigation that we're already seeing uh, with some of the plaintiffs uh, bar, uh, you know, I think there's going to be continued challenge to all NCAA um, rules that restrict um, the amount of benefits that uh, student athletes can receive. So in this age of uncertainty with respect to NCAA rules, how would you counsel other general counsels to prepare for the issues raised in Alston? I, I, in, in many respects, this is an incredibly exciting time. Um, the last time um, college athletics was going through something like this was really 1906, when Teddy Roosevelt took brought a bunch of uh, college presidents to the White House and said, college football is out of control. Uh, either you come up with a way of regulating it and controlling it, or, or I will. Uh, the result was, uh, was the NCAA. I think we're seeing a paradigm shift. Uh, I think intercollegiate athletics is going to look uh, very different in three to five years uh, than it looks uh, right now. Um, I, in terms of what I would say to, to my uh, to my colleagues is beware, be very aware of every single uh, issue. Uh, these issues are emerging and uh, you're going to have to constantly monitor this. Something that um, you know, it, uh, we, we did, but athletics was surprisingly not at uh, our highest priority, the thing that, that uh, would keep us up at night prior to this. Now I, I, I think there are enough problems that it really is one of the, the more pressing things that, uh, that comes across the general counsel's desk. And I think there's also a very different um, 
dynamic between uh, the large NCAA Division I schools that are in the Autonomy Five conferences, other NCAA Division I schools, and of course, Division Two and Division Three are, are a very different uh, environment, so. Well, at least you're in a state that has a name image likeness executive order so you have some direction with respect to name, image, and likeness issues. If you were a general counsel in a state that doesn't have an executive order or a state law yet on name, image, and likeness, what would you do? Well, my understanding is that the NCAA has said essentially everybody needs to follow their state law or their uh, executive order. Uh, and if you don't have a state law or an executive order, then what you need to do is to develop a policy and then follow that. So I would say um, to my colleagues in states that do not have um, uh, in a law or an executive order that is currently in effect to develop a policy that um, reflects uh, the best of what you think uh, the policies um, are that are out there. And, and I would also note that while the Kentucky executive order is in effect and some states uh, are also have statutes also in effect, there are other uh, statutes that have not yet gone into effect. Our, our neighbors to the South, Tennessee, their statute does not become effective until uh, July 1st, 2022. But my understanding in talking to um, some of my counterparts at, at Tennessee schools is that uh, they're going, they know what the law is, it's just not effective yet. And they're going ahead and complying with the law as it will exist in a year, um, figuring that they're going to be, um, to be safe. But, um, you know, there, there will be a number of merging issues with uh, name, image, and likeness as it is implemented. Um, I think there will probably be a marketplace among states if one state has a competitive advantage over another. Um, the schools in that state that are disadvantaged will be pressing their legislature to amend the statute uh, so that they can, in, in effect, um, take adva advantage of whatever their uh, rivals in other states are, are doing. Well, that's helpful advice. In the new NCAA world, when you're looking at Title IX issues and you're a Title IX expert, what pitfalls do you foresee? Well, uh, a, a couple. One is, is as you alluded to, uh, whatever uh, help um, assistance schools are giving to um, student athletes with respect to uh, name, image, and likeness. And, and nobody can really do the deals for the student athletes, but you know, you can do, do guidance. Uh, you are approving their, uh, their, uh, the, the various contracts and in, in forms that's gotta be done the same for both men and women to the extent that you are mandating a financial literacy course, which, uh, I think the better, uh, uh, name, image, and likeness statutes have that. Uh, obviously, the, the you have to do that for both men and women for revenue and non-revenue um, sports. Uh, now, beyond that, it's I don't think it is a Title IX uh, issue if one athlete um, is able to capitalize on his or her name, image, and likeness more than uh, more than another, uh, and I think there may be situations where uh, some of the women are actually uh, able to make uh, quite a bit more money than than some of their uh, than some of their male counterparts, and I think that's perfectly okay as long as the um, institutions structure and uh, review and you know, mandatory financial counseling is the same for both. Um, for both sexes. The more interesting issue, uh, I think, comes is if um, limitations are, are lifted. Um, obviously, 
a uh, to the extent that you're giving people uh, benefits, you're going to have to give those benefits on an equal basis to both male athletes and, and female athletes. Um, and one of the things that I think is an intriguing emerging issue is, as you know from your time at the Department of Education, Title IX is, con is confined to educational programs and activities. Well, there's no doubt that high school sports is, is an educational program or activity. And I think you can certainly make that argument for most sports at the college level, especially Division III, uh, Division II. But there may be some point at which college athletics ceases to be an educational activity and, in fact, becomes a business. Uh, I'm no expert on antitrust by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm not aware of uh, an antitrust case involving um, an educational benefit. Uh, it's, it's basically how people conduct business. And the court seemed to think, uh, and by the argument of the plaintiffs, that um, the at least at Division I for football and men's and women's basketball, these were business um, opportunities and were commercialization and re made references to labor. Um, you know, that's, that's very different than I'm a student pursuing an educational uh, activity. And it may be a, a dichotomy that we may see down the road sometime. Hmm. Well, that's a great point. But in your book, you talk about the Tower Amendment and the Javits Amendment and Congress considered that at one point, whether to really just take out the intercollegiate sports and not make them subject to Title IX, but the Javits Amendment did make them subject to Title IX. So it'll be interesting to see the arguments as to whether collegiate sports continues to be an education program or uh, activity. The one under current NCAA bylaws with respect to if you have a men's football team, Division I, I mean, you've got a, a bit of a risk there providing the education-related benefits with respect to those student athletes. What would you do to make sure that you're complying with Title IX? Well, the, it, it's important to, to note that the limitations, which uh, were uh, the injunction that is in place, the, what the Supreme Court said, yes, this, this injunction is, is okay, the previous limitations violated antitrust law, dealt with... Um, in effect, academic awards, as opposed to necessarily uh, educational be benefits like tutoring. We're, we're obviously giving tutoring to men and, and women athletes. There's no requirement that anybody give an educational award, you know, to say, oh, you, you, you made the dean's list, Here, here's $1,000 or whatever. Uh, but if you do so, then you have to make eligibility for those awards um, equal between men, men and women. Um, there's right now, uh, I, I think if you did it, um, you would have potentially some, some problems if your institution also has football. Now, if your institution doesn't have football, if you only have division one, one basketball for men and division one basketball for women, that's uh, that's roughly equal. There uh, have been several uh, folks who have urged the NCAA, okay, you, you, you lost Austin. You need to adopt whatever rule you currently have for basketball for all other sports, which uh, would allow us to ensure that if we give uh, the opportunity to get educational awards that that applies to all athletes, regardless of sport and uh, regardless of of, of sex. Uh, and I suspect that that's that's where where we will be. And you know, you're absolutely correct. Back in the '70s, there was an attempt legislatively to uh, exempt uh, to to exempt football. But one of the things that was interesting to me is is I read the briefs. If you read the NCAA's brief, they talk constantly about amateurism and really portray uh, intercollegiate sports as something that we, we really see at the Division III model, uh, a kid playing the sport for the love of the game uh, without any real thought to, to making uh, an enormous amount of money and the, the school uh, paying the coach uh, you know, market rates, but you know, it's 
not a, a big deal. If you read the briefs of the plaintiffs, um, they portray the uh, college athletics as sort of the NBA light or the uh, WNBA light or the the NFL light. Uh, very different uh, modes. Sort of this is a business ver versus this is a, this is is an educational uh, benefit, and it will be interesting to see how this unfolds over the next uh, three to five years. And of course, as the court made clear, um, you know, Congress gets to make policy choices. And they said, you know, Congress can make this policy choice, not, uh, not the courts. So it will be interesting to see if there is uh, legislation in Congress and what direction that may go. Well, thank you so much. I think we've got one more question before we take questions from our audience. So what are your thoughts on the future of intercollegiate athletics in three to five years? I think in three to five years, it's going to look very different than what it looks <laughs> now. I think it's also, you know, it, it, it's college athletics has really just changed dramatically in the last decade. Uh, I've been at the University of Kentucky uh, almost nine years, will be nine years in, in October. Um, when I came to the University of Kentucky, there was no such thing as uh, the SEC network, basically our ESPN channel devoted entirely to um, SEC sports. There was, there was no ACC network. There was no such thing as a college football playoff, which is uh, outside of the NCAA's domain. Now we have uh, those networks for the conferences, which generate uh, a great deal of, deal of money for the conferences, which they share evenly among their schools. We also have a college football playoff, which has been uh, very lucrative for the conferences that are consistently participating. And there's serious talk about taking that uh, college football playoff from uh, four teams uh, to 12 teams. Uh, if if that happens, that's even even more revenue, um, and uh, you're going to have, I think, further litigation uh, on the various limitations that are imposed, and the world will look very different in five years. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your willingness to be with us, and I think we're going to hand it over to Reed to... Sure. We've received just one question so far, and if others have questions, please feel free to uh, to enter them in. And the question is about goes back to the name, image, and likeness laws, and asks specifically about uh, California's law and uh, its its timing. So I'm going to turn to Janet to answer that question. Thanks, Reed. And if there are other questions, I encourage you to put those in that question widget, um, particularly while we still have Bill here. But the question that came in was about um, California and whether the California bill is going into effect in September. And it is true that there is a California bill that looks very promising. Um, the reason I didn't include it on my list is because it has not been signed. So if Governor Newsom signs that bill in August, then it is going to go into effect September 1st. Um, the statutes that I listed on that slide for you are bills that have all been fully passed, signed, and are in effect today. Um, so I think there is another question um, in the chat now, and I hope others will take advantage of these last few minutes. Yep, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It says, do you have any indication yet on how this decision will affect international student athletes? Specifically, whether NIL agreements will be considered unauthorized employment for students on F-1 visas, including whether an active or passive involvement analysis might apply. Also, any advice on how international student offices and athletic compliance offices should approach the subject. USCIS, DHS, and SEVP have not provided clear guidance. Barnas, do you wanna take the question about that? Or I'm happy oh. to if you take a shot at it. <laughs> yeah, you're, no, you're welcome to, um, Jane and I were just discussing it and we, Jane, you go ahead. We actually posed this very question to our partner, Jackie Stone, who um, is a terrific immigration practitioner here at McGuire Woods. And she said, 
that she is confident that this income is not going to be treated as passive. And so if it's not, then it is going to put international students in a very different position um, than students who are U.S. citizens because they could be precluded um, by the terms of their visa not to take advantage of NIL contracts. So um, I'm really just passing along my colleagues' thoughts on that, but it, it does look like it could present um, an interesting and complex difference there. Right, and just um, for the uh, information of, of folks, uh, it is something that I think uh, institutions are are looking at and are worried about. And you know, we are uh, instructing our international students to talk with our international center, which uh, is very knowledgeable about what is and is not uh, permissible under the various visas. And, but it, it is going to, to have an impact related somewhat to that and this applies to everybody. Uh, obviously, this income is income for uh, tax purposes. And you have situations where you have um, students who have never filed income taxes before, maybe come from a, a family that uh, is below the poverty line or just above, and suddenly somebody is making fifty thousand or or a hundred thousand uh, dollars in income. It's um, it's great for the, the student athlete and for the student athlete's family, but it also has some major tax consequences. And for people who are not in the equivalency sport, where you may get uh, half of your half of your tuition, room and board is paid for through an athletic scholarship. And the other half comes from a Pell Grant or some sort of, fi of need-based financial aid. Suddenly, with this um, name, image, and likeness income, you no longer have financial need or reduced financial aid. So we do. We have a couple more questions that have come in. There's one about antitrust, so I'm going to go to that one first. Do you have any advice from an antitrust perspective if schools want to reach out to other schools to see how they're handling specific companies that have reached out to student athletes across the country? It's an interesting question. I, I think it's generally okay if, if you were to inquire among some peer schools about uh, the, the third parties that they're, they're interacting with related to name image likeness. Where there's risk is if a large group of schools were to come together and whether whether it's under the NCAA guise or, or otherwise, and say, okay, here, here's how we're gonna handle interactions with third parties. Uh, again, as I talked about a little bit earlier, if, if the group is small enough, uh, it probably doesn't garner any antitrust concerns uh, because students could have opportunities to go to, to schools that would have different rules. But if, if there were to become some type of standard uh, that that a large number of schools signed on to that uh, could uh, could have some antitrust implications. Another question here, what new roles will be needed for college sports programs in regard to recruiting and NCAA compliance generally with new NIL legislation in effect? Bill, do you have any, any thoughts on that uh, question? Sure. Um, I think it's it's fairly obvious that um, there's going to be a number of people who are going to be employed simply to review these um, NIL contracts and to um, ensure that they adhere to the institution's policy and, and perhaps to uh, the state law. Uh, I know our uh, compliance office, which uh, I think may be the best compliance office in the country, um, is is working overtime on that. So I, I see more of, of that. Um, you know, there are um, a large number of uh, right now differing standards 
uh, if you're a coach in Kentucky, what you can and cannot uh, do or what is permissible under NIL uh, is different than what it is in, in Tennessee or Florida. Uh, also, everybody has said uh, pretty much universally, I think, that you cannot um, promise a student athlete a, a particular NIL income or, or deal as a condition of enrolling or to induce them to, to come. That's easy to enforce with respect to the coach. It's not so easy to enforce with the prominent local business person who really wants a, a strong team and lets it be known that if, if you come to X school, um, they will make sure that you have substantial uh, amounts of name image likeness income. Yeah, there's some interesting, interesting implications there. Uh, we're about five minutes over time. We, we received a couple more questions, so we will make sure to follow up with you individually if we haven't gotten to your question. And I just want to conclude by thanking Janet and thanking Farnaz, but especially thanking Bill for joining us. Uh, we really appreciated your insights, uh, and I hope that everyone has, has learned something and garnered some insight from uh, this session today. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have questions, please feel free to send us emails. We're more than willing to engage. And I'm not going to offer that for Bill, but for Janet, Reed, and me, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thanks so much.